to introduce myself. I am Chaplain Bishop Archduke Dr. Robert L. Maxwell, the prophetic road could have arms ministry of Pomeranian Livonia, Colonel of the Royal Guard of Pomeranian Livonia, Philip Marshall of the prophetic road could have arms Livonia, and Knight of the Sacred and Military Order of Merits of Prophetic Road Code of Arms Ministry and Livonia. And today we're going to be <coughs> looking at a very interesting subject. Food for thought. So, without further ado, let's uh, do so. One K-10 to one the Queen of Sheba heard how famous Solomon was, so she went to Jerusalem to test him with difficult questions. One K-10 to two she took along several of her officials, and she loaded her camels with gifts of spices, jewels, and gold. When she arrived, she and Solomon talked about everything she could think of. One K-10 to three he answered every question, no matter how difficult it was. 1 K 10 to 4 The Queen was amazed at Solomon's wisdom. She was breathless when she saw his palace, the food on his table, his officials, his servants in their uniforms, the people who served his food, and the sacrifices he offered at the Lord's temple. 1 K 10 to 5, C 10 to 4. 1 K 10 to 6 She said, Solomon, in my own country I had heard about your wisdom and all you've done. 1 K 10 to 7 but I didn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. And there's so much I didn't hear about. You are wiser and richer than I was told. 1 K 10 to 8 Your wives and officials are lucky to be here where they can listen to the wise things you say. 1 K 10 to 9 I praise the Lord your God. He is pleased with you and has made you king of Israel. The Lord loves Israel so he has given them a king who will rule fairly and honestly. 1 K 10 10 The Queen of Sheba gave Solomon almost five tons of gold, many jewels, and more spices than anyone had ever brought into Israel. 1 K 10 11 In return, Solomon gave her the gifts he would have given any other ruler, but he also gave her everything else she wanted. Then she and her officials went back to their own country. King Hiram's ships brought gold, juniper wood, and jewels from the country of Ophir. Solomon used the wood to make steps for the temple and palace, and harps and other stringed instruments for the musicians. It was the best juniper wood anyone in Israel had ever seen. 1 K 10 12, C 10 11. 1 K 10 13, C 10 11. 1 K 10 14 Solomon received about 25 tons of gold a year. 1 K 10 15 The merchants and traders, as well as the kings of Arabia and rulers from Israel, also gave him gold. 1 K 10 16 Solomon made 200 gold shields and used about 7.5 pounds of gold for each one. 
one kit N17 he also made 300 smaller gold shields, using almost 4 pounds for each one, and he put the shields in his palace in Forest Hall. One kit N18 his throne was made of ivory and covered with pure gold. One kit N19 the back of the throne was rounded at the top, and it had armrests on each side. There was a statue of a lion on both sides of the throne, and there was a statue of a lion at both ends of each of the six steps leading up to the throne. No other throne in the world was like Solomon's. 1 K 1020, C 1019. 1 K 1021 Since silver was almost worthless in those days, everything was made of gold, even the cups and dishes used in Forest Hall. 1 K 1022 Solomon had a lot of seagoing ships. Every three years he sent them out with Hiram's ships to bring back gold, silver, and ivory, as well as monkeys and peacocks. 1 K 1023 He was the richest and wisest king in the world. 1 K 1024 People from every nation wanted to hear the wisdom God had given him. 1 K 1025 Year after year people came and brought gifts of silver and gold, as well as clothes, weapons, spices, horses, or mules. 1 K 1026 Solomon had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses that he kept in Jerusalem and other towns. 1 K 1027 While he was king, there was silver everywhere in Jerusalem and cedar was as common as ordinary sycamore trees in the foothills. 1 K 1028 Solomon's merchants bought his horses and chariots in the regions of Musri and Qu They paid about 15 pounds of silver for a chariot and almost 4 pounds of silver for a horse. They also sold horses and chariots to the Hittite and Syrian kings. 1 K 1029, C 1028 1 key 11, 1 the Lord did not want the Israelites to worship foreign gods, so he had warned them not to marry anyone who was not from Israel. Solomon loved his wife, the daughter of the king of Egypt. But he also loved some women from Moab, Ammo, and Edom, and others from Sido and the land of the Hittites. 1 key 11, 2, C 11, 1. 1 key 11, 3700 of his wives were daughters of kings, but he also married 300 other women. As Solomon got older, some of his wives led him to worship their gods. He wasn't like his father David, who had worshipped only the Lord God. 1 Key 11, 4, C 11, 3. 1 Key 11, 5 Solomon also worshipped Astarte the goddess of Sido, and Milcom the disgusting god of Ammo. 1 Key 11, 6 Solomon's father had obeyed the Lord with all his heart, but Solomon disobeyed and did what the Lord hated. 1 Key 11, 7 Solomon built shrines on a hill east of Jerusalem to worship Chemosh the disgusting god of Moab, and Melech the disgusting god of Ammo. 1 Key 11, 8 In fact, he built a shrine for each of his foreign wives so all of them could burn incense and offer sacrifices to their own gods. 1 Key 11, 9 The Lord God of Israel had appeared to Solomon two times and warned him not to worship foreign gods. But Solomon disobeyed and did it anyway. This made the Lord very angry. 1 Key 11, 10, C 11, 9 1 Key 11, 11 And he said to Solomon, you did what you wanted and not what I told you to do. Now I'm going to take your kingdom from you and give it to one of your officials. 1 Key 11 12 But because David was your father, you will remain king as long as you live. I will wait until your son becomes king, then I will take the kingdom from him. 1 Key 11 13 When I do, I will still let him rule one tribe because I have not forgotten that David was my servant and Jerusalem is my city. 1 Key 11 14 Hadad was from the royal family of Edom, and here is how the Lord made him Solomon's enemy. 1 Key 11 15 Some time earlier, when David conquered the nation of Edom, Joab his army commander went there to bury those who had died in battle. 
Joab and his soldiers stayed in Edom six months, and during that time they killed every man and boy who lived there. 1 Key 11 16, C 11 15 1 Key 11 17 Hadad was a boy at the time, but he escaped to Media with some of his father's officials. At Paris some other men joined them, and they went to the king of Egypt. The king liked Hadad and gave him food, some land, and a house, and even let him marry the sister of Queen Tarpes. 1 Key 11 18, C 11 17 1 Key 11 19, C 11 17 1 Key 11 20 Hadad and his wife had a son named Jubal, and the queen let the boy grow up in the palace with her own children. 1 Key 11 21 When Hadad heard that David and Joab were dead, he said to the king, Your Majesty, please let me go back to my own country. 1 Key 11 22 Why? asked the king. Do you want something I haven't given you? No, I just want to go home. 1 Key 11 23 Here is how God made Rizzo son of Eliada an enemy of Solomon. Rizzo had run away from his master, King Hadadza of Zobah. 1 Key 11 24 He formed his own small army and became its leader after David had defeated Hadadza's troops. Then Rizzo and his army went to Damascus where he became the ruler of Syria and an enemy of Israel. Both Hadad and Rizzo were enemies of Israel while Solomon was king, and they caused him a lot of trouble. 1 Key 11 25, C 11 24 1 Key 11 26 Jeroboam was from the town of Zadar in Ephraim. His father Ebat had died, but his mother Zerwar was still alive. Jeroboam was one of Solomon's officials but even he rebelled against Solomon. 1 Key 11 27 Here is how it happened. While Solomon's workers were filling in the land on the east side of Jerusalem and repairing the city walls. 1 Key 11 28 Solomon noticed that Jeroboam was a hard worker. So he put Jeroboam in charge of the workforce from Marcel and Ephraim. 1 Key 11 29 One day when Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, he met Ahijah, a prophet from Shiloh. No one else was anywhere around. Suddenly, Ahijah took off his new coat and ripped it into twelve pieces. 1 Key 11.30, C 11.29 1 Key 11.31 Then he said, Jeroboam, take ten pieces of this coat and listen to what the Lord God of Israel says to you. Jeroboam, I am the Lord God, and I am about to take Solomon's kingdom from him and give you ten tribes to rule. 1 Key 11 32 But Solomon will still rule one tribe, since he is the son of David my servant, and Jerusalem is my chosen city. 1 Key 11 33 Solomon and the Israelites are not like their ancestor David. They will not listen to me, obey me, or do what is right. They have turned from me to worship Astarte the goddess of Sido, Chemosh the god of Moab, and Milcom the god of Ammo. 1 Key 11 34 Solomon is David's son, and David was my chosen leader, who did what I commanded. So I will let Solomon be king until he dies. 1 Key 11 35 Then I will give you ten tribes to rule. 1 Key 11 36 But Solomon's son will still rule one tribe. This way, my servant David will always have a descendant ruling in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to be worshipped. 1 Key 11 37 You will be king of Israel and will rule every nation you want. 1 Key 11 38 I'll help you if you obey me. And if you do what I say, as my servant David did, I will always let someone from your family rule in Israel just as someone from David's family will always rule in Judah. The nation of Israel will be yours. 1 Key 11 39 I will punish the descendants of David, but not forever. 1 Key 11 40 When Solomon learned what the Lord had told Jeroboam, Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. But he escaped to King Shishak of Egypt and stayed there until Solomon died. 
1 Key 11 41 Everything else Solomon did while he was king is written in the book about him and his wisdom. 1 Key 11 42 After he had ruled 40 years from Jerusalem. 1 Key 11 43 He died and was buried there in the city of his father David. His son Rehoboam then became king. going to look like in the, obviously, the period of the golden age of peace and prosperity when everyone at that time will be born again who will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and God's moral and civil law being the God the law of the world, and there'll be some people who, uh, pockets who adhere hypocritically to being a Christian. And that, even then, is still a foretaste of the third world age and heaven age, the beauty, the glory the wisdom and the eternal state in our resurrected bodies is going to be more glorious, more beautiful than you can imagine. And we see an example of <coughs> letting all that power and glory and all that kind of stuff go to your head then beginning to think that hey I don't need God I got all this 
just by myself. And then we learn really quickly and really fast the consequences of those actions. We saw the division of the empire of Israel dividing into two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, but Psalm repented, turned back to God, but by then the consequences of his actions were too late, but he got himself right with God. So what's the lesson here? Absolute power absolutely corrupts people. Absolute power absolutely corrupts. King Solomon began to rely on his own power, glory, and prestige. In other words, he started to believe his myth and forgetting who put him in charge. In a, you know, a TV series many of you probably heard of it called West Wing. It's about the basically about the people who help the President of the United States in the West Wing. And of course, you know who those are. It's all about speech writing and so forth. But it's basically based on a fictionalized uh, president and so on. It's a good TV show. Don't agree with the politics, but the politics and President Joseph Bartlett and the, and the story is a lot better than Obama, but I'm not going to get into that. But then they did an episode of mixing fantasy and reality, and you had these people talking about the White House and the President of the United States and their experience. Real people that actually worked in the West Wing that were a part of that. And when they spoke of the President of the United States, something very, something disturbed me the way they communicated to uh, about it. There was sort of like this cultic personality behind the President of the United States. And he had people say, we serve at the pleasure of the President. And I sat down thinking about that. I went to bed. There's something really disturbing about it, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But there's almost like this cultic, but what's disturbing about it is like almost like this cultic devotion, uh, cultic personality of devotion to the President of the United States. No, the people that work in the West Wing don't. Uh, serve at the pleasure of the President, they work for the President of the United States. The President of the United States is not a king. And the President's wife is not a queen, or vice versa, if we ever get to that point.
almost like this unhealthy reverence towards the President of the United States. And the truth to be told that I don't think that was the founder's intention at all in this great republic and because in the political view of the United States of America the people that are on the bottom in politics well I'm not going to get into it but Was very disturbing. It was almost like the end, this like cultic, almost like worship towards the president, these people that worked in the White House. And that is very disturbing because the West Wing people don't serve at the pleasure of the President of the United States. They work for the President of the United States of America. President of the United States of America is not the king, and the wife of the President of the United States is not the queen of the United States of America. It was kind of weird. It was almost like more uh, more protection than the Queen of England has. And the members of the House of Windsor and so forth. Truth be told, it seems that we have gotten our priorities wrong. Because when it comes to serving and living for God, we belong to an upside down kingdom. The President of the United States is not the most important person in the world. God is. And there is almost like this cultic reverence for the President of the United States of America. We serve at the pleasure of the President. And there's something very disturbing about that. Almost like this almost cultic devotion and worship for the President of the United States, which is absolutely wrong because the President of the United States is a human being and the people that work in the West Wing are those who work for the President of the United States. It's almost like the, the President of the United States has become uh, almost Revered, respected like hundreds of years ago. Of the aristocratic family of monarchs and empires of the past, and that is not what the uh, founders of this country had in mind. And it was almost like this arrogance and snobbery behind it that disturbed me. Because power, absolute power, absolutely corrupts. It reminds me, and, and the President of the United States is so guarded and so protected that no average citizen can approach them. It reminds me almost like the 
old days of the aristocracy family or the emperor, the kaiser, the emperor of a monarch where they very seldom made any public appearances and propagated this myth about the king and so on. seems like that uh, we've kind of went in that direction when it comes to the United States of America, this great republic and republic, uh, which is, I don't think, ever intended in the founding fathers of the United States of America. It's very disturbing and wrong, and I can see why foreign countries look at us and think that we are a bunch of in Americans or a bunch of imperialists trying to establish their empire because the president almost has taken on this mythological position of being the emperor of the United States of America and more so of the Obama than ever before in the past. say, but the America, the United States of America isn't the most important country in the world. All countries are important. And the President of the United States ain't the most important person in the world. Everyone is the, is the most important person in the world. And we count in the matter and absolute power absolutely corrupts. We belong to an upside down kingdom, a kingdom of service. And God is the most important person of the universe because he is a person and he's also God. so forth, 
clock our judgment and thinking and we've gotten this attitude like, hey, we're the United States of America, we can do whatever we want. We start relying on our military and our power and our money and so forth and have forgotten who has given us all that forget to put God in the picture, we're going to find ourselves in some serious trouble in the future. We could find ourselves for a while, all of a sudden, Muslim radical extremists take over the United States of America somehow everything that we stood for all of a sudden changes and everyone's all of a sudden subject to Shuri law and the religion of Islam and so forth and we'll be sitting there thinking to ourselves what the heck happened I thought we were the greatest country in the world Israel was only successful when they respected and honored and recognized him as the author and dispenser of blessings and curses. When we relied on him, we saw victory. When, when they relied on, when they relied on God, they saw victory. But when they they saw devastation. And don't get me wrong, America's a great country. But we've gotten our priorities messed up and it's time for us to get back to what it's all about. Back to the foundation, the fundamentals of what this country's about. And I don't think that the founding fathers envisioned what we have now, and it looks, the President of the United States and all this stuff looks more like a, a monarch or an empire or something rather than what it was intention, uh, intended. A country that respects and honors freedom of speech and freedom start throwing out God out of the picture of this country, this country cannot work, it, the democracy cannot work, uh, the republic, uh, this republic cannot work when we start throwing out God, out God from the picture and relying on ourselves, it cannot work, it cannot maintain, it cannot stay. country is envied by other countries. Re uh, republic cannot work without uh, God in the perspective. A republic and a democracy cannot work without God involved in the picture. It just cannot work. to that, we might just end up like the empire of Israel that we read about in the book of Kings, when King Solomon started turning, we could end up like them.
certain extent. misinterpret what I'm saying. This country is still the greatest country on the planet. But we need to keep things in perspective and recognize who has blessed us with this great country. And I think that we have lost our the purpose and plan of this country that we belong to. This republic, this democracy that we belong to, but we've been putting too much emphasis on the government solving all our problems and expecting the government to solve all the problems of the world, and it's not going to happen. Period, because. It just can't. We should be turning to God and His purpose and His plan to help us fix these problems. It doesn't take the President of the United States. The President of the United States of America cannot fix all the problems of the world. It takes us working together and committed unified in our commitment of faith to God and serving and living for Him, playing a part and role and fulfilling the Great Commission, reaching people with the Gospel from the East, from the West, from the South, from the North, and remembering that absolute power absolutely corrupts. I don't know who quoted that, but it's a good quote. ourselves ending up like what happened to Israel in first the book of Kings and now we have over in Israel this constant battle between Palestine and Israel Let's create peace over there. God isn't pro Israel, nor is he pro Palestine, but he's pro peace. He doesn't like this. Judas, or House of Judah supremacy. What needs to happen over there is the people need to work together and create a democracy, a republic that respects and honors all people of all ethnicity, represent our respect and freedom and the values and principles that the Bible teaches, that the founding fathers of the United States of America had in mind, working together, living together, loving each other,
working together to create a republic, a democracy. That's how you create free peace. And uh, of course, us playing a role in you know Christianizing that area. two chapters just give us an example of what can happen when you let power go to your head and you start thinking that I'm superior, that I'm great, I'm awesome, uh, letting all the wealth and all the perks and so forth go to your head and you start forgetting who blessed you with that and start thinking, I'm the one that accomplished that. And when you start thinking like that, serious consequences happen. And the United States of America or any other country in the world can find themselves in the same situation that the Empire of Israel found themselves back then. It later took half of it took place when the division of the Empire of Israel took place, the division between the House of Israel and the House of Judah, and then the captivity, and the scattering, and so forth. history. You can see it happen in history and you can see this history happening in America and all the other countries around the world. People are saying, no, 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 no way you gotta do something like that. Well, do you know that? I bet a lot of Israelites during the Empire of Israel thought that same thing. There's no way this is going to ever happen. God promised. This is a promised land. This is what's going to happen. Obviously, it was just a type and shadow of the real promise of Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus fulfilling the types and shadows of the Old Testament. So, anyways, it could happen. It can happen. It can happen to any country. It could happen to country, we're not the greatest country in the world. It's lots of great countries, but are, it's the ideas that are more important. Those ideas that line up with uh, the truth the word of God, in line with God's moral and civil law, and we're all here to play a role and a part in fulfilling the Great Commission. And so we need to take serious those facts and realize that we belong to an upside down kingdom. As the Apostle Paul said, I'm the least of the Apostles. And he wrote most of the New Testament.